Hi. Uh, can everybody hear? I guess so. Hey, so thank you. Uh, welcome uh, to today's panel. We're going to talk about the debut of a, a new comic book, The Liberty Brigade. Uh, I'll let the panelists uh, introduce themselves. I'm the writer. I, I'm Michael Finn, so it's my first time uh, writing a comic book, and I thought that I would need a lot of help, so I, I brought along a, a lot of my friends to help make my work look a little bit better. So I'll let them introduce themselves, uh, talk about what they're doing, and we'll talk all about the book. Oh, oh, me first. Okay. Hello, I'm uh, Mark Buckingham. Um, I'm sort of best known for fables, and I'm currently doing uh, new Miracle Man stories with Neil Gaiman. And I had the pleasure of contributing a one-page strip with a couple of the characters for Liberty Brigade. Uh, just, should I say which ones? Is that okay? Uh, Bill of Rights. Bill of Rights and uh, National Anthem. Sorry. Um, I'm Barry Kitson. Um, I've drawn pretty much everything at the moment. I'm drawing Doctor Strange for Marvel Comics and uh, I'm penciling about half of the Liberty Brigade. Yeah. I'm uh, Mark Wade. I've written everything else that Barry's drawn. <laughs> uh, I, and I am, I am editing Liberty Brigade. I'm Sean Chen. I've been working for about a quarter century in comics. Probably most known for Iron Man is some Marvel uh, other stuff like uh, X-Men, um, and I did the cover to Liberty Brigade. I'm Marty Bowman, I work for Pixar, and I did the logos and some fake ads. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so thank you, Marty. So, um, so I love the golden age of comics, the 1940s and the 1950s, and I wanted to bring back a lot of these characters from the 40s and 50s that nobody has ever heard of, that people have forgotten, that were famous, and people really knew them. Uh, there was a villain called The Clown, and he appeared in dozens of issues, always fighting heroes named Magno and Davy, and today no one knows him, but he was a precursor to the Joker. So I wanted to bring back a lot of these characters, and I wanted to do a tale set in uh, World War II, and um, I talk about the characters, but I wanted really fun thing, people uh, that, that look visually interesting that may not have had a great backstory. So if you look at the Liberty Brigade, if you look on there, um, the upper left is a character called the Blue Flame. And he was uh, around way before Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. Uh, he can obviously burst into flame. We have Catman and Kitten. Um, down at the bottom left, we have a character, Mr. Freedom, who's a new character. You'll have to read the book a little bit, find out why he's a Golden Ager. And then we have uh, National Anthem at the top, a new character. Uh, the Mad Hatter, he was a lawyer by day and fought crime at night. Everyone told me that character's unrealistic. A lawyer by day would be stuck <laughs> doing legal work at night. Uh, the Green Turtle, who was the first Chinese superhero. Uh, back in the 40s, they weren't so uh, excited about Chinese superheroes, so the Green Turtle never got to show his face in the interior. He walked around with his arm in front of it, or blocked by a tree, or all kinds of other things. And then last, we have uh, Johnny Rebel. He was a patriot hero of the South. So we wanted to bring back all, all of these characters, make them visually exciting, and I, I want people to get to talk about what, what they thought of it, what Mark and the others thought, but I want to tell you one little secret on this cover and the zero issue that's for sale here. All of the villains in this book are from the 1940s. They appeared only on a cover of a comic. They never showed up in the interior, and they never had a name. So I gave them a name, and I put them in print, and Mark Wade helped ensure that I had some decent dialogue. Barry brought them to life on this cover. Mark, Mark and Sean gave me uh, encouragement the whole time. And one of the great things, why Marty's up here, not just logos, I wanted this book to have cool retro ads. So when you turn it over, they look like the 1940s. They look really awesome. So um, I don't know if the rest of you want to chip in and talk about what you thought as we were talking about the script and characters. Anybody else? Well, I was just gonna, I'm just glad it's happening because I remember your enthusiasm for this concept in the early days and your doubts about your ability to be actually able to bring these, these things to light. And I think we all just thought, but if the ideas are already there in your head, it, it's, it needs to happen. You know, you, you, these things tend to sort of write themselves if you allow the adrenaline to just sort of carry you along and get into it. 
And it's, it's the, you know, you, you'll never become a writer thinking about becoming a writer. You just need to write. Yeah. And that's what you did, and you're doing an amazing job. Yeah, I mean, the, the fact that it's a passion project for Mike is really what made it appealing, I think, to all of us. I mean, it's no one's career goal is to make the Mad Hatter comics. <laughs> but the cool thing about that is then you look at the roster of characters and you go, oh, you know, actually that guy kind of is interesting, or there's room to make this guy who is kind of a blank slate from the 40s kind of interesting. And so that's what, you know, that's what was appealing to me. I mean, he picked me really, he says, because I'm a good editor, he says because I can help him with the story, but the reality is he picked me because I'm the only guy in the world who can match him character for character, you know? The flaming eye, yeah, I know that guy. Like, you know, so. I take exception to that. I know some of these characters, too. <laughs> I had a Green will, Turtle I comic will, once. I will throw down with you anytime, anywhere. Okay, do it right now. Come on, <laughs> put some money on the table. <laughs> So that was, I mean, just by show of hands, how many of you actually know any of the characters of the 40s? Anybody follow it? Oh, great. Excellent. So. How old are you? Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Superman and Batman don't count. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so, look, we really wanted something to be fun. I wanted it to be uh, something that would be accessible to people. I, I looked for costumes that were interesting. I looked for um, characters and villains that would be interesting. I really wanted people like Sean and Barry and Mark to help me. And if you buy the book, the last page is a black and white preview. What we did to make it easy for people is we have one page origins of all the characters. You can buy the book, it's downstairs. But there's one page origins that go over who they were and why they were there. And we got great people. We got Mark did one. Uh, Mark Buckingham, not Mark Wade, drawing that page. Uh, we got George Perez, we got Alan Davis. Alan uh, inked himself for the first time in 20 years. Um, I have to tell you, they've overestimated my skills as a writer. For those who saw the plot, I think I'm on plot number version 20, but uh, Barry helped me many times, Mark helped me, Mark Wade helped me. At one point, Jim Steranko read the plot, and his comments to me were, this is not a story, this is a parade. <laughs> so I thought I would have to uh, add a bit more uh, characterization. Um, well, let me ask you something. So, you're new at this. What are the challenges that you, you've been reading comics all your life, you wanted to get into this, what were your biggest challenges from the start? Well, I think one challenge is to when to stop reading the comics. And what I mean by that is, I kept reading hundreds of Golden Age comics and then reading more and more and more till I had a list of villains and heroes that I wanted to do. Right. I, I think another one, I, it took me a while and it really does happen, is how do you get into the character's head? Once I figured out what each character was going to be about and that was aided by talking to people and looking at the visuals. Yeah. When, when Barry and Sean brought someone to life, I thought, okay, yeah. this is what I think they're about. Yeah. yeah, good. So how did you go about picking the artists? Uh, well, I started with people I knew that might be able to help. Um, and, in all honesty, one of the artists I wanted from the start for the book isn't here today. I wanted Ron Friends. I thought he had a great clean line. I thought um, some of the characters, uh, when, I, when we were creating a character, the Bill of Rights, um, who walks around wearing the Bill of Rights on his shirt and looks like a Revolutionary War hero, um, I created him using um, Photoshop. And I kept using Ron Friend's versions of the character. And I think at one point, Mark Wade said to me, this, this, this character looks a lot like Ron Friend's character. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think I, I wanted Ron, when I talked to Barry, uh, who's a very good friend, I, I never thought his schedule would open up. And I was beyond thrilled uh, when Barry said he could do it. And that's when the graphic novel went from 40 to 80 pages, as I started adding new stories um, and new adventures. Uh, and then for the one-page origins, I really thought how wonderful it would be to have some different styles, to have people whose work has meant so much to me, such as Mark, to have somebody like Marty, who I teasingly refer to as the great one, um, who's got a great book called Toy Box Time Machine about all kinds of fake toys, and you ought, you ought to go get it. But um, when I thought about having him do retro ads, and having these 1940-style ads, we have a group in the book called the Women of America, the WOA, and he created a great World War II version, kind of a logo, and we have all these female characters from World War II, including one called War Nurse. 
So warriors went around and instead of healing people, punching them and attacking them. But I thought that was that's just a thought, yeah, yeah. just a great character. I would to like have. to see your certification, ma'am. Uh, also in the book are my all my two favorite World War II uh, characters of all time. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Airmail and his sidekick Stampy. <laughs> so Airmail and Stampy are, are there. And um, we are have a character named the Battling Hobo. The Battling Hobo is named after a Marvel Comics character. We wanted to use the Marvel Comics character. But Marvel still has them under copyright, so... Because you, you never know when you're going to go publish a battling hobo comic. <laughs> right. So Marvel's character is the fighting hobo. So we are going to change our name because we did not want Marvel to tell us that they hired Mark Wade, Barry Kitson, Mark Buckingham, and Sean Chen to do a fighting hobo miniseries. I actually hate it, by the way. It's like the, 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 Man, the life dream shattered. <laughs> Well, that's cool. So now, now, what? Look, I got into the Golden Age characters when I was a kid. I think from reading Jim Steranko's books. Jim Steranko is an artist of the '70s, one of the most influential artists ever to read, ever to do comics. And in the early '70s, he wrote these two giant tabloid-sized histories of comics. Does anybody know yeah. or have these? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I just I absorbed them. I read them over and over again, and I was so fascinated. He would mention all of these Golden Age characters and the little cover reproductions and stuff. That was what made me curious about the airmail and stampies of the world. Um, you? I thought they were uh, just such bizarre, weird characters. Uh, how could we come up with something uh, for them? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll reveal a little something. In the graphic novel, Airmail and Stampy are always seen at the White House protecting the president, more so that the Axis think the president has these superpowers, but we decided in our graphic novel they have no superpowers. They're just two people who wear a costume because I thought the name Airmail and Stampy was really ridiculous and wanted to figure out how to do something with them. But they had an interesting little visual look um, and, and, and we wanted to use them. Uh, I wanted characters, I wanted some that were around, Catman and Kitten. For those who read their Golden Age adventures, they were quite famous. Uh, Kitten actually, in the comic, if you talk to comic folks, inexplic inexplicably aged from an 11-year-old to about an 18-year-old, uh, with no explanation given. Uh, that's just how the artist rolled in those days. Yeah. One day she was four <laughs> feet tall, and the next story she was, you know, five four mm -hmm. and looked fully developed. So it was a fascinating uh, um, paradox. And, and people often write, somehow there must be a story never told about how this poor child aged seven years, and no one seemed to notice. Uh, but but we'll have to write that part some other day. I think that story is a publisher realized that this guy's running around with an 11-year-old girl. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the story. Uh, I, I think that's right, Mark. I think there are those who uh, follow it. I will say I do get comments from people insisting to me that Kitten's really 11 and that, that my story won't be that good, but even I really couldn't come up. <laughs> that's, there you go. Kitten's actually 11, so your story sucks. <laughs> they haven't even read it yet. All 80 pages is devoid of, of value because of this. I want to meet the guy who argues that who, I want to live in a world where being upset over the age of kitten is the biggest thing in my life. <laughs> it, is, um, it is a startling thing. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, we have a character in there called Icarian Son of Icarus. For anyone who ever read, uh, I think it's Colossus Comics number one. And the, by the way, show of hands. Anybody? Anybody? Well, good. 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 Marty. Yes, Marty's been quite the critic. It's Marty who yells at me about kitten. But, uh, but uh, on the back cover, the inside back cover said, coming next issue, and had a drawing of this winged character that looks so cool. Uh, I carry on, son of Icarus. Sadly, there never was a next issue. <laughs> so I decided that I was going to resurrect good old Icarian and stick him in my comic somewhere because I thought it deserved publication. Um, you might, I, I wonder if uh, Barry and Sean will comment, when I called them up, told them I wanted to do this Golden Age team, they were probably really excited we're going to do, you know, famous characters, you know, we'll do the Fighting Yank, and then I gave them this list of people that neither had ever heard of, but maybe they both can comment a little. Well, for me, I, I guess comics 
for me started with uh, the image era. So this stuff is really not something I'm familiar with or had any particular passion for. So it was tough to get around. So what I did, like my favorite uh, comic was Watchmen. And I think there's a very similar thing where they cobbled together a bunch of superheroes that weren't being used. And if I were to draw that book, and um, basically what I do is just imagine that this is someone's, someone's Watchmen, so it deserves the same amount of TLC. Even though Watchmen had Alan Moore, this, this book has Mark Wade, so. <laughs> so yeah, yeah so it was not the same. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just sitting, sitting here wondering if Airmail and Stampy ever abandoned their post. Oh. Oh. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I don't know, that, 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 that book really pushed the envelope. Oh. <laughs> Terrible, we'll have to fit that in. We'll definitely have somebody uh, I wanna, say that. You should talk about the heroes that didn't make the cut, because I'm very upset that the bouncer is not in the book. Oh boy. Okay, so we, we did choose. We looked at the Fighting Hobo. We had to pass on um, the Vagabond. We thought long and hard about the Vagabond. We thought about Driftwood Dave. There were uh, actually five different hobo homeless characters. And apparently in the 1940s, uh, there were thousands of readers reading about homeless characters um, and their adventures. Um, in fact, where is Kevin? Kevin, are you here? There he is. Um, the Fighting Hobo's name was Butch Brogan. That is uh, Kevin Brogan of the Hero Initiative. So in our comic, the character is going to be named Kevin Butch Brogan. So the actual battling hobo is in the room. Thank you. And we thank him for signing a release to use his name. Thank you, Kevin. Um, there are a number of characters I wanted to use. I've been sticking them in all of these one-page origins. So if you look at the comic that Mark did, uh, he's doing the Bill of Rights and the National Anthem. And then I have them uh, attacking the Jester and Satana. Satana's from Moon Girl. Uh, so I tried to figure out, Marty, how to fit everybody in somewhere. Uh, but it turns out, in the golden age of comics, there were hundreds of publishers. Many of them came and went. Many of them would have the same cover and different interiors. Mm -hmm. uh, one comic I came across used the same cover twice in five issues. So I, I don't know what the fans were thinking. Um, when, when they bought that. Um, I've had to have a number of arguments as to whether I'm talking about V-Man, Captain V, or Captain Victory, as two of them are wearing the exact same costume, except one wears an eye, eyelid and the other doesn't. The exact same costume. Um, the other funny thing is, the names, so many of the names we know today were in the 40s. Wonder Man, The Vision, you know, Catman is a villain in the DC comics, but, 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 but was a character there. Uh, the Mad Hatter is another Batman villain, I, I, I believe. Um, sadly, the Green Turtle is yet to show up in the modern era, but we're hoping maybe in a, a Fables or something they'll, they'll you know, have a Green Turtle story or something. So who, who did you have to pass on? You had to pass on the Bouncer? We passed on the Bouncer. His, but his, his superpower was a toga. Yes, yeah, yeah, he... That allowed him to bounce. That was, that was, we were, we were really sad about that. Um, it was actually Antaeus, the bouncer. It was, yes. We passed on uh, the Al, um, who I did want to use. Interesting, there was a hero, anybody ever hear of K the Unknown? There's a hero called, uh, of course, Marty. There's a hero called K the Unknown. K the Unknown wore boxing gloves. Apparently, the publisher decided this character stinks because the very next issue, the, the person who was K the Unknown became the Owl and then had months of adventures and never referred again to the fact that they were K the Unknown. Um, we're on Kickstarter and we're just a couple thousand dollars away. We want to bring back a different K the Unknown. We, we've got an origin story and, and want to have that. So please help us bring back K the Unknown. Uh, Marty, anybody else you can think of we really passed on that we that we wanted to have? Uh, Rockman. We didn't use him. A Ajax. Uh, Ajax. Uh, we, Ajax. We didn't use any of the spacefaring folks. You, yeah, we you, used, oh, you passed up all the insects. I, I did. The yellow jacket. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the fighting swarm. Say again? Are those stories to be told later? Do I hope know? so. So if you read this book, The Liberty Brigade, um, this is our zero, our little prequel, but if you read the graphic novel, something I'm really proud of is one of the characters says something and talks about six or seven other teams and says, well, we had the Women of America, the WOA, defending the home front. Roosevelt's Raiders were fighting in the east. The Axis Smashers were in the west. And the Freedom Fighters were at the ports. 
Poor Barry Kitson has to draw all of those super teams in giant splash pages, so thank you, Barry. Uh, I do hope people will want to see some of those adventures because we were really thoughtful, or we tried to be, about who would be in some of those teams. So we have uh, the Boy King and his giant, if people know the Boy King when the Nazis invaded his little country. Um, we have permission from the owners of the Green Llama to do a little Green Llama story, um, but the Green Llama will only be if he appears in three pages. Right. Uh, I, I love the fact that someone out there not only owns the character yeah. Green Llama, but is yeah. protective of him. Right? Yeah. <laughs> in case that movie deal comes through. Can I, can I mention my favorite that got left out? Microface. Microface is the best. Yeah, he's, he's the best. He has like a, a little, like his mouth is like one of those things in a urinal. <laughs> and he can talk like a robot through it and stuff. Yeah. Well, I, I want you to know. Also, there is nothing micro or face about him. That's right. <laughs> the name just is just randomly chosen. But it's awesome. But it's awesome. The, 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 the grill on the lips and yeah. The, what yeah. Is that? Yeah. Well, well, he may come back. Uh, so, <laughs> let me say this: we tried to do in these one-page origins to add add a whole bunch of characters and use characters that um, might not be able to be in the book, but we wanted an appearance. Um, to get to see Mark draw the Jester again, who looks just like the Jester who fought Daredevil in Marvel Comics, mm -hmm. but predated him by you know 60 years. Yeah. Uh, was, was something that was really exciting to me to see Satana uh, mm -hmm. with one N, unlike the, the one with two. So to come back to see Mark take, you know, four lines of script for me and turn it into something uh, incredible, um, really to me is very exciting to see these people come back to print. So I don't know, Mark, if you have a passion for any of them or how you think about them. Well, I mean, I, I, I certainly I'd loved um, microface. No, I, you know what? I'm waiting to see. I hope I've not. We will, we'll circulate yeah, please, please, this yeah, next yeah. week. We'll circulate yeah. microphase. But um, uh, I, no, I think in the, in my case with um, Bill of Rights and, and National Anthem, it's because those characters were actually Michaels. I mean, they, those were the ones that you brought specifically to this project, and I think that was the thing that I liked. That there was there was some fresh blood. It was like no, we're, we're not just stopping. With with exploring all these old characters, this this is a world that can now be explored and fleshed out, and and, and I like that aspect of it. And they and they're wonderful characters. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. So, yeah, your question. Yeah. So you're already funded, though, right? I mean, you said you're a couple short. Oh, I'm, I'm working on my stretch goal. So yes, oh, we're okay. already funded. K the unknown is a stretch goal. <laughs> So, so before we do that, I will make a comment. One person commented, uh, as soon as I started, you can go on Facebook and, and also to uh, www.thelibertybrigade.com. Uh, and one of the people went there and said, I really want to see my all-time favorite hero, Mirror Master, uh, Mirror Man. Mm -hmm. Mirror Man basically traveled through mirrors and, and punched people, and then inex inexplicably later uh, became kind of this mirror-like uh, non-physical entity um, so I said, okay, fine, and I later told the person he's going to be, you know, beaten up somewhere, but he is in the story, and, and so he's very excited. Um, one other one that I do want to comment is TNT Todd. For, I believe, 19 issues, T TNT Todd was a federal agent and always referred to as Todd. Uh, for the last two issues, he became a superhero. Um, oddly enough, in all of those issues, we never learned if Todd is his first or last name. Everybody just said, Todd, do this, and Todd, do that, Agent Todd. So we, we never learned, but we wanted to fit them all in. So we are on Kickstarter now. We've got an 80 page uh, story, plus uh, at least 20 of these one page origins by all kinds of artists. Uh, we've got some pinups and a few other things that are, are going in there. We were very fortunate to uh, get funded on day one. Uh, but again, it's poor guys like Barry who have to, I'm like, hey Barry, uh, how would you like to do a cover for me? And Barry says, oh great, uh, that, that'd be great. I'm like, excellent, I would like 11 characters and 12 headshots. Uh, and by the way, uh, a few of these characters, um, only their head was shown on the cover of the 1940s, so, so you'll need to come up with more. So I don't know, Barry, how'd you think about drawing that? Um, I'm not I'm perfectly happy to draw um, from heads. Uh, making up costumes is fun. Um, I have a legitimate question. 
when you are faced with a challenge, how many? There are eleven guys on this cover, right? In the Possibly 12. more. Possibly more. In the, in, in, the, in the main shot, like as an artist, how do you see that? How do you break that down? How do you make that work? Um, on like on that cover right there, like what? Where did you start? Or I mean, how do you even start with something like that? Well, as as with most things, I start with a very small thumbnail. Okay. Because um, right. that way, you know, I can see the whole thing. Right. With an easy ass and, and kind of start with a design and work from that. So, okay. it, and probably in this one, it, it, there's basically, if you look carefully at it, there's a spiral in there of characters. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. If you kind of so, uh, you try and try and find a path to take your eye from one to another, and so I come up with a design that I like, and I send it to Michael, and Michael says. Can you move those characters from the back to the front? Because they're my favourites. Um, I do say things like that. Um, and so then, so then, yes, I just start again and go, oh, well, the eye's never going to follow me around this, but if Finn's happy, I'll just do it. The hobo has a question. Yes, Mr. Hobo. So what, what, to Mark's question, what was the first character you drew to get the spiral going? I mean, how do you start that? Um... <coughs> I wish I could remember. <laughs> um, the one with a hat. I, I know I told you, I know I wanted, so I, I, I love Sean's piece, and Sean's piece is fabulous, um, and it, I, I adore it. The only question that I, I, I would have raised is Mr. Freedom is front and center, and if you read the story, Mr. Freedom is my uh, golden age villain who's got a pardon to fight the Nazis, so I thought, well, I, I like on another cover to have the two characters that I created a little more central, but I love both of them. They're so dynamic, so I know on this one I had told Barry I wanted the Bill of Rights and Anthem to be a little more Yeah, central. you did. I, I actually did another cover as well, which Michael asked me to do something along the same lines as Sean did. But Sean's was, dead, you know, it's just such a perfect cover. It pretty much came out looking exactly like Sean's. Um, and I also put Mr. Freedom in the center because Sean had done it and he looked so good. And then Michael pointed out that we were both being completely uncooperative by doing that. Um, Artists never listen to the writer, especially when he's a novice. <laughs> I said, if I was Mark Wade, you would have done what I wanted. <laughs> Not Barry, but... <laughs> So, uh, Golden Age comics have a very specific tone to them, and a certain way that they're written. Did you mimic that tone, or is this kind of like a cynical view of what it would have been in the, in the 40s? Um, so, absolutely not a cynical view, um, no. I, I wanted to, and, and, and Mark should comment as well, and everybody else who's read my script, I wanted to try to make the language a little more sophisticated, but not have that sense of cynicism and irony. I really wanted them to be shining characters. I wanted there, and if you read it, to have romance in there, to have characters who cared about each other, to have Catman and Kitten uh, be, be in a relationship, to have Bill and Anthem be, be dating, uh, to have, um, later you'll find Airboy and Valkyrie, you'll find um, uh, others like that, that, that I, I wanted to, and some of those stories started in the 40s. Right. So maybe I don't, Mark, if you want to comment. Well, just that, I mean, I think that one of the things that drew me to the project is that it was earnest. It's very easy to write cynical. It's very easy to write a lampoon of that stuff. That's easy. Mm -hmm. Writing it earnestly is harder, but it's it's of the tone. But one of the hallmarks of Golden Age superhero comics is that they were super racist. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they really were. And so you know, obviously, when we say it's of the tone. Not completely, no. <laughs> no. Sure. You know what, that's a great point, Mark. Let me comment on that. I delivered um, some diversity in this book. Right. So, um, in, in the book, playing a great role as a character named Ace Harlem, uh, there was an African-American journalist in the city of Philadelphia in the 40s. He was unhappy that all of the characters were white and thought, I, I would like there to be some African-American heroes. So he created a comic called All Negro Comics Number 1. Uh, it was a very interesting comic. He wanted to do all Negro comics number two, and no one would sell him any ink. Uh, today, it's really unknown today, actually, whether that was racism or they didn't want co competitors. Uh, but I wanted to use uh, Ace Harlem in the book. That was very important to me. I wanted the Green Turtle, uh, who is Chinese. That was important to me. Uh, a couple of the white heroes had, you know, um, kind of racist uh, helpers. Rufus the butler. 
Uh, we have Rufus the butler, but that's a facade because he's actually a technological genius uh, in our comics. So I did make some minor changes where I wanted it to update who those characters were, get away from that uh, kind of the racist tone uh, that was there for them in the 40s. And I, I wanted them to shine again. I wanted this book to have some really interesting uh, uh, characters like that. So I hope people will react well to it. That's why the Green Turtle is on the team. I looked really hard uh, when I found uh, this, this Chinese uh, character and saw that his face it was never allowed in the interiors. I was just not, I was adamant that wasn't gonna happen. I wanted a Native American character, and there's an aviator who's a Native American character, Tommy Tomahawk, and he runs around with a. Not the racist about that. He runs around with a, 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 a war bonnet all, all, all the time. So I did talk to a friend who's a Native American, and he will be flying, but he'll just have uh, three feathers, which Probably is what his yeah. tribe does. Mm -hmm. But he won't wear his war bonnet in the cockpit as he's <laughs> flying around. There was a real American number one character. It was just an Indian that beat up guys. American Indian. Now he tells us. Now. Now he tells us. <laughs> but yeah, as, as Marty will back it's up. It's too late. <laughs> yeah, as Marty will back up, if you're looking for racial and sexual diversity in Golden Age superheroes, you are looking in the wrong place. Right. So with that in mind, Michael made extra efforts and, and tried to you know find his way around that. So And I think he's done a good job of that. Alternatively, if you're looking for Nazis with skull faces, this, that's yeah. the place to go. Is, yeah, he has a whole place. team of them. That's right. If you like bunch of Nazis, this is the book for you. So, uh, in our book, let me talk about that for a minute. Everybody can can jump in. Uh, the main crux of the graphic novel um, concerns an attempt by uh, Adolf Hitler and his his four uh, super uh, villain advisors, uh, Misery, the Claw. The Great Question, who was a very famous villain back in the 40s, and of course, the Deathless Brain, uh, a Japanese uh, a warrior who died and his brain was put in a semi-transparent uh, cube with tentacles. Uh, they, they, the four of them are advising Hitler, and uh, because who better to listen to than a brain in a glass jar? Really? Himmler, backseat to you. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's hear what the brain has to say. So, so the brain, uh, they hatch a plot to uh, assassinate President Roosevelt, and they use uh, two teams we created. Um, one is comprised of all of the reptilian snake villains that I could find, and the other is comprised of all of these skull villains that I could find. So we have like the singing skull, the laughing skull, uh, the crimson skull, who looks just like the red skull, but he's the crimson skull. And he predates the red skull. A completely, completely different kind of thing. Uh, we have the ghoul. Who, so anybody, in fact, even if you look at this, this giant, he has a little skull on his chest, so he, he made the cut too. So so I, I, again, when Mark first asked me, how, how do you get started? Well, the first thing you got to do is stop reading the comics. So they kept reading more and more and more. <laughs> and every time, like, oh, I need one more Skull character, just one more. I'll have to read another 400 comics, and I'll, I'll surely find one. Um, because every issue in the Golden Age, a bunch of Nazi or uh, other Axis uh, villains showed up. Uh, were defeated, uh, you know, in eight or nine pages in a 40-page comic, 50-page comic, and then the next month they did it all over again. So, Dave, anything you want to know? I know you're going in big on the Kickstarter. The economic stuff that are interesting to me, I assume the Kickstarter is what enables you to financially, you know, pay these guys. I assume they're getting paid. That's sort of something. Now, hey, I'm printing the first issue. That's what they are. I financed it with my poker winnings, beating you, Dave. Well, how do you do this going forward? So let me talk about that. Um, number one, the first thing, you know, once you decide that you really want to do something, that your heart's really calling you to do it, you've got to figure out, of course, how many pages, what can you afford, what are the publishing costs, uh, how do you deal with the talent. Um, how do you pay the talent? When do you pay the talent? Do you give them a share of the profits? You know, how do you do all of those things? Uh, I think I'm really blessed that I had a good group of uh, friends that were willing to help me uh, see this through. Uh, you know, so that that was really important. Uh, that Kickstarter was important. Uh, we're publishing uh, in the United States. That was also something I wanted to do right now. Uh, it's in color. It makes it easy. 
um, given some of the things with tariffs going on, I, I didn't want to necessarily try to finance overseas and find out it would cost me five times what I, I wanted. Um, plus, you can print to order here, Dave, so you don't have to be like Marvel or DC and order 20,000 copies and then say, well, I only could sell 5,000. Um, we're also blessed with a partner, Nucadia.com, who is an online seller of comic books. Uh, they offered us coupons for every buyer. I would encourage people to check out their site and buy a Golden Age comic from them. Uh, and they're going to handle the fulfillment for us. So they have special boxes, special shipping, and, and that's going to make my life a, a lot easier as well. Um, there are also companies that could do that. If you were thinking of doing a Kickstarter, no matter where you live, I think they're called Backer Kit or something, and they can do fulfillment for you. There's a whole bunch of companies out there that, that can do that for folks. I, the second part, I don't think you've heard what you asked. Is this a one-done or new I don't want it to be a one and done, so we're working on uh, an issue two and an issue three that I'm sort of trying to plot out and figure out uh, what would happen there. I talked to someone last night who told me they really loved uh, Anthem, so we were thinking already of how could we maybe find a six-page backup story uh, that would fit into their schedule, or at least I am. They don't know that yet. <laughs> yeah, right. Sorry, Thank Mark. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't want it to be a one and done. I think these are great characters. I want them to see the light of day. I want people to react well. I wouldn't have gotten uh, Sean and Marty to take time off from Pixar and Mark Wade, who can write it, all of his own projects, and Barry, who Mark and everyone else want, and Mark Buckingham, who could do anything they wanted. I wouldn't have got any of them if they didn't see how much passion and love I have for this. Yes, sir? Uh, are you hoping Liberty Brigade becomes like, you know, The Walking Dead or Fable? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, sure. Sh uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, that will certainly be carried on the strength of Mark Barry, Mark Sean, and Marty. And have little to do with me, and I will uh, gladly turn it over to some showrunner and, and, and hope they'll let me have a walk-on appearance once in a while. Hey, can we take a quick micro-face break? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, you're going to need to see micro-face. Coming on or no? Should be in. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Yay. 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 <laughs> I repeat, he does not grow, he does not shrink, his name is Microface, regardless. <laughs> he was tweeting long before Twitter. Oh, he well, well played. So. Well, that must have terrified villains. Let me, see if I can find the, let me see if I can find the bouncer. You guys go on. Oh, yeah. oh I'll tell you another character we wanted. Everybody here knows the Punisher, right? Oh, anybody, yeah. anybody know Sparkman? No, so, okay, Sparkman. Sparkman, for those who don't know, he, he was, there were two different, there was a, the first conceit about Sparkman was one of the earliest heroes where you didn't know who he was. There were several heroes that might be Sparkman and took several issues into the comic to figure out who he actually was. Uh, he figured out he was a violinist, he could play the violin and it created some electrical signals and he could conduct them through his gloves, but he was the precursor to the Punisher. He went around when he wasn't hanging Nazis, shooting them, throwing them off trains, running them over with trains. Uh, every issue he found, apparently in the golden age of comics, there were thousands of Nazis running around the American homeland <laughs> and, and dying in all kinds of bizarre ways uh, in hundreds of comics uh, every, every month. There's the bouncer, he, he wore a dress. Um, <laughs> my question is... You said there was no diversity. I, <laughs> I, I see, he also starred with uh, Rocket Kelly and One Round Hogan. Is not the guy you want to be fighting, because I'm assuming... Let's presume it's One Round in his favor, because that's not how I'm reading this. I'm reading this like One Round, like Glassjaw Hogan. Did you use uh, Rocket Kelly and One Round Hogan? Were you tempted? I, I, I really was tempted, but I, I, I gave them up in favor of Mini Midget, who were a, a mini midget. So we're actually going to call him Mini uh, in our comic. Mark, but, but, yeah. see, if you, <clears throat> see if you could find Dr. Hormone. Dr. Hormone? <laughs> <laughs> Really? No. I don't really. Don't talk. Don't talk about Eisner that way. That's mean. <laughs> <laughs> really? Oh, come on. You have to make a living. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, I guess the other comment I'll say is we wanted to bring back a lot of the patriotic heroes. So we look for a lot of those in the red, white, and blue to, to fit them in on these other teams. Um, oh my God. You found them? Doc, yeah. So I know who he is. I didn't want to use him. <laughs> oh my uh, God. That was easy. 
go, please. And Dr. Hormone. All right, so so let me just make a comment. There he is. <laughs> let me just make a comment. When you have to do a book that involves um, the great one, Marty Bauman, you have to go in with a really strong uh, backbone of steel because Marty's team would have been, you know, unsellable. The Liberty Brigade starring Dr. Hormo, one round Hogan. Uh, you know, I, I just... It, I, I, Mark and I could not come up with a story where one round Hogan, and then imagine asking Mark uh, and Barry, hey, I'd really like you to illustrate Dr. Hormone. <laughs> maybe. So, maybe. So, yeah. no, we, 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 we skip this. The adult, yeah, no, no, no. So, um, again, the Liberty Brigade hopefully will save the day in the graphic novel and, and move to uh, additional adventures, but we have uh, uh, Minnie and Riddy, who were mini Midget and Riddy. Uh, they were shrunk by a villain, and their names were never used, so we had to give them a name. The Blue Flame showed up in one six-page story. He never had a name, and he never had an origin, so we've given him one. And one other change we made to the 40s. For reasons I don't know, most of the heroes ran around in shorts and short sleeve shirts. So I actually, you know, gave them long pants and long sleeves most of the time, thinking, why are you guys running around? Well, I, I can answer that. I think that's because most of the Golden Age heroes, even Superman, were modeled after circus acts. I mean, that, yeah. that was where you found costume characters with capes and tights back then were circus performers. And so they all sort of dress, circus performers all dress like the high wire guys and stuff. Mm. And even today, you look at, you know, what few trapeze artists are left, you know, they're wearing shorts and tunics. So that is true. How many of you ever read a book called The Twelve? Anybody read The Twelve from Marvel Comics? It's a great book. It was illustrated by uh, the wonderful uh, Chris Weston and Gary Leach. Uh, in that book, uh, 12 Golden Age Heroes from Marvel Awaken to Modern Era. I personally was always put off by the fact that Chris Weston made sure to show each and every hair on the male character's legs in their little short shorts as they ran around. So I decided that my guys would uh, spring for long johns and, and that they would probably... Uh, I think it makes a better visual as well for the characters. Uh, so that, that was really important. So uh, I, I hope you'll really support the book. Um, I, I, any, any other questions for anybody? Or I'll give you one last comment from me and see if anyone else has any. We were very blessed. Um, we used uh, Professor uh, Ralph Ullman and his great uh, researcher, uh, Robert Mormon, uh, to, um, from GW Law School to look at and investigate for us the public domain status of all of these characters. So um, poor Robert kept getting a list. I said, oh, it's only 40 characters. And it became 60 and 70 and 90 and 100. And the poor fellow had to keep trudging back to the copyright office. But we wanted to make sure that these were public domain characters. And as a thank you, uh, you will find a warden in this comic named after um, uh, Professor Ullman. So you will find uh, Warden Ullman. We decided that he can uh, uh, oversee a federal penitentiary. So that was his reward for help and assistance. Uh, Warden Ullman sounds as good a character as any of the other characters that you mentioned. <laughs> He should also be wearing shorts and tights. <laughs> well, he's a real person, and we really... Uh, so I, was the hobo. Yeah, he is. In fact, I would encourage everybody to buy the book, go to the Hero Initiative, make a donation, and get Kevin Butch Brogan to sign the comic as the fighting hobo. Um, yes, sir. Did you ever actually explain the stretch targets? No. Oh, no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, see, I'm such a novice. Uh, I believe if you go to the Kickstarter, our first stretch target was um, a Yankee Doodle Jones versus, I think, the Singing Skull pinup by Rick Megger. It's already drawn, penciled, and inked. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I think our second stretch goal is a one-page origin of a team of uh, triplets known as the Triple Terror. So, uh, you know, I, I, people probably, who are these people? We're the Triple Terror. Gee, do you think it's those three triplets that keep vanishing whenever the Triple Terror shows up? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, um, I know three triplets, I wonder. Yeah. I, I, there you go. You want to show uh, Minnie, who looks just like Aquaman. Yeah. So Aquaman's costume, Aquaman stole poor uh, Minnie Midget. Uh, he stole his costume for the most part. Um, but there he is. Uh, he looks exactly like him. 
Uh, he looks exactly like him, and so Aquaman took that. Uh, I believe our next stretch goal after um, those two is uh, a four-page uh, origin story for K the Unknown. We have a new K the Unknown we want to uh, introduce. We have a great tie. It's going to be an African-American female character. We have a great tie to a Golden Age character. I, I really hope we, we hit that. Uh, after that, I think we have a Green Llama uh, stretch goal, and if we hit that, I have a few more, but I, I didn't want to get too far ahead of myself because uh, the poor art team uh, would be called upon to draw it. My editor would insist on renegotiating his contract because of the additional pages, and uh, that would be a problem for me. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, this might sound like a dumb question, but other than like, in the United States, basically, heroes of heroes also considered like adding other other heroes from like other countries, like Star, like uh, Poland, Soviet Russia, France, like. That's not a dumb question at all. That's a great question, and I want you to know I actually thought long and hard about it, but I was unable to afford sending Robert Mormon to the um, copyright offices of the foreign countries. But in all seriousness, I, I really did want to do that. I just don't know how to know. I, I didn't want to step on. I really do respect the intellectual property rights, and I didn't want to step on some of the characters. But there is a character who seems to wear the flag of several allied countries all at once that I think is in a public domain, and that character may in fact uh, show up, though their costume looks a little goofy. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yeah, I was just hoping that you would have like, like maybe like a whole superhero here, a Soviet superhero, and I was like, make it not uh, based on, on like, you know, the U.S., like, the common trope is the United States won the war. Yeah, but we also contributed, well... Uh, right, right. Let, me, let me give you a great comment on that. Um, in our... <laughs> Right. In I, think, our book, I think you'll find that Britain won the war. Soviet blood, American steel, and British intelligence. So those were... Yes. yes. So let me, let me comment on that. The green turtle in our comic is not an American. The green turtle is a Chinese uh, person from China. Uh, in World War II, many people don't know the Chinese and the Americans, they were all fighting on the same side. And so the Green Turtle will make comment in reference to the fact, when I leave, because his country and our comics sent him here to help out the Allies and, and be part of that. Uh, I would love maybe in future issues to have the Liberty Brigade be somewhere else. In issue one, they're largely going to be working to stop the assassination attempt, but I was very deliberate that the Green Turtle is not an American and is not, is not a citizen of the, of the United yeah, okay. States. Yeah, I was just wondering, that's all. Right. Uh, if you could get Blackhawk, you'd have them all covered. Yeah, so, uh, Blackhawk, yes. Uh, or, thank you, Marty. <laughs> if you don't have, uh, if you're using public domain characters, have you trademarked the Liberty Brigade name? Uh, the Liberty Brigade name, yes, that has been trademarked, as has thrilling nostalgia comics, so I tried to make it both exciting and nostalgic uh, <laughs> at the same time. And good old Marty Bowman is the one who I stick with all of these. I told Marty, well, Barry's going to draw the women of America in a giant splash, and it won't look right unless they have a cool logo. And then I came back, he says, okay, Michael. And then I came back and said, I created a new team called Roosevelt's Raiders, and they need a cool logo. <laughs> and now I've taken all of the... Oh, air fighters of World War II, and they need a cool logo. So Marty just creates logos, and it's ruining the day that, you know, he ever said he would help me out. <laughs> the best Although, ones didn't even make the cut. Your public domain <laughs> characters, have you changed their costumes in an attempt to create things that you have the perpetual rights to? Um, there's a company called Dynamite that does that, so they use the Black Terror and others, and they made minor modifications uh, to their costumes so that they could own that original version, and I, I, I encourage people to read their, their books as well. They're doing something a little different, putting them in the modern age, but it's a really wonderful set of books. Um, to answer your question, no, I, I, for the most part, deliberately wanted to use the original costumes of the characters, um, and then I made some minor modifications. So um, I'm happy to keep talking. I think we're coming to the end here, if I'm if I'm right. Um, maybe one last question. Did you ever run into like sometimes like with music and entertainment that there were regional aspects that you had a character made here on the West Coast that really want to take on the West Coast, but you had a, maybe a doppelganger on the East Coast that was just something that 
and the protests or he could if he had any story about that or find out something. So Ace Harlem, for example, All Negro Comics 1, uh, people have puzzled quite a bit over what the distribution of that comic actually was. We know it was distributed in the Philadelphia area. We believe it was distributed in parts of the New York area, but it does not appear to have been a nationwide uh, comic book. There were others like uh, Rural Home and other kind of strange uh, little companies. Uh, there was a character called Rocket Man and Rocket Girl, and then they were published in Canada, and it was the same exact comic, but they called them Jet Man and Jet Girl. Uh, Cat Man and Kitten. Uh, when Cat Man he was published in Australia, they got rid of Kitten and gave him a completely new sidekick, but kept the same person. Uh, and he had the same name, he was Cat Man. Uh, Cat Man also told people two different origins. Um, one other thing I should tell folks, if you read the Green Turtle comics, boy Mark Wade's about to have a field day, yeah. uh, he constantly tried to tell his origin to his sidekick, Burma Boy, and uh, uh, every time in the comic he says, oh Burma Boy, let me tell you how I got my powers and something happens. And then a few issues later, okay Burma Boy, back to my origin, what, what happened, how I became the Green Turtle was, and you know, that was, he couldn't show his face and he couldn't tell his origin, so we have managed to uh, solve both of those problems uh, today. Else? Anybody else? So, um, on behalf of everybody, thank you for coming. If you haven't we had gotten one of the free prints, please come on up. Uh, I want to thank this great team of people. I want to thank Sean for uh, bringing this to life, for allowing the Baltimore Comic Con to make it the official shirt and the convention guide. Marty for designing every single logo in the world. Barry Kidson for having the immense patience. I'm going to come back to Mark. The immense patience to put up with me and my, my ridiculous demands and to draw multiple characters. I think there probably are far more than 11. Uh, a nine-member superhero team is tough. Um, Mark Buggingham for many hours of encouragement telling me no I think you really can write and my just thinking it's just impossible and of course Mark Wade who, who, who absolutely everyone knows that Mark is an incredible writer he has no need to be an editor and I, I thank him for his generosity and kindness in helping me in this as well so thank you all I hope you'll support the book and thank you everybody